The great hero and the demon lord had a great battle. The demon lord tried to mock the hero, claiming that if he fails, the world will end. The hero grabbed a small rock and thought it was all he had remaining. The demon lord unleashed all his power and thrown a huge boulder toward the hero. But the hero countered it by using his small pebble to destroy it. The hero was tired of small games and wanted to finish it all. The demon lord accepted, and they pointed their sword toward each other. Using their most powerful abilities, the two engaged in the last confrontation. After several clashes, both were exhausted, to the point that the hero's hair turned white. Moved by their desires, the two slowly walked forward and stabbed each other. They collapsed, yet the hero was relieved that everything was over. Fast forwarding to the future, we see a young boy happy to join school. He notices the students greeting each other and asks if that's what friends do. He feels relieved because that's what normal people is supposed to do. That young boy is none other than Blade, the hero who defeated the Demon King. He jumps in happiness, mentioning that he will make friends and live as a normal person from now on. Blade happily walked in the hallway, telling himself that it was time to make some friends. He greets every random person he walks by and notices some students talking about how he seems a transferred student. He notices it and introduces himself, and finds out they're called Kasim, Clay, Jessica and Claire. He reveals that he's there to make friends and the four accept. Blade is happy that he now has four friends, but now he aims to have 100 friends. Claire tells him that for that he needs to befriend all students. Suddenly, a girl interrupts their conversation to ask why Blade is creating a commotion. She says that they're all students at the Rosewood Academy, an academy that creates heroes, so they should follow rules and order. The group reveals that she's Ernest Flaming, the strongest student in school, and is called the Empress. Yet, Blade simply introduces himself with a big smile. But Ernest doesn't care, she asks who the hell he is. Claire tries to explain that Blade just transferred in. But Ernest still doesn't care, claiming that this school only admits people who want to be heroes, and they shouldn't accept late admissions. Yet, Blade drops the ball when he mentions he doesn't care about becoming a hero. He's only here to make friends. Ernest goes on a tantrum because he doesn't have any resolve to protect people. Yet, Blade doesn't care and asks her to take him to the principal's office. She shows him the way and knocks the door. The principal tells them to get in, and when Ernest sees the principal's face, she bows down in respect. Blade doesn't care about it, and talks to the principal in a casual tone. Ernest grabs his leg and calls him an idiot. She asks if he knows who the principal is, and Blade is like, sure I do. She then starts begging the principal to forgive the new student, because he doesn't know that the principal is the king. The king laughs it off, mentioning that he heard about Ernest from the previous headmaster and reveals that he's now the new school principal. Ernest starts complimenting the king, like any loyal subordinate would do but she almost never ends licking his boots. Gladly, the king tells her that's enough and that she should leave because he needs to speak to Blade in private. She gets out and gets mad because Blade treats the king just like a casual friend. Blade then blames the king because he just got on her bad side because of the whole situation. He asks the king what he is doing here, and the king reveals that Blade lost his powers after the fight with the demon lord, and he wants him to regain his hero powers. Blade gets annoyed because he wants to be an ordinary person. But the king ignores him, calling this school just a rehabilitation center for Blade. The king continues ignoring Blade, and explains he will change the school curriculum. He wants to create great heroes, just like Blade was. The young boy tries to dismiss it as unnecessary because the Demon King is dead. The king mentions the report about Blade's last battle against the Demon King, resulting on both losing their powers. Yet, he believes that there's a way to restore Blade's power. Blade is still pretty annoyed, because the king always acted like this, but he decides to ignore it. Blade returns to class, where everyone is doing their own thing. He notices Ernest and tries to talk to her. She asks him what is he doing in the S class. Blade explains he took the exam for F classes but he was told to come here. She thinks he bribed someone to get into the school and the S class. She explains that this isn't a school that admits people half-hearted to get in and claims that he cheated. Blade claims he's dead serious in this school. He wants to make 100 friends. He starts introducing himself to every person around, claiming he wants to be friends with them. Ernest gets annoyed by his actions, but he suddenly pats her head. She gets shy and tries to attack him with her sword, but Blade swiftly jumps to dodge her attack. Another student named Sophie interrupts them to tell that the instructor told them to assemble. Blade introduces himself to her twice, but she only ignores him. Ernest then explains what he's doing, and the girl introduces herself as Sophie. Blade starts shaking her hand, yet, Ernest calls the instructor. She tells that she wants to test Blade's ability, the teacher tries to stop it, but surrenders after being intimidated. 
she gets an enchanted metal armor and tells that every S-Class student can easily slice through it. She tells that he must also do it to prove his power, or he must leave the academy. She tries to explain that S-Class is on a different level compared to the remaining ones. But Blade is like, how many levels are we talking about? She replies that they're at least three levels above the rest. Blade is slightly impressed and decides to use his second sword skill. He unleashes his fighting spirit, impressing everyone around. They notice it's the rarest and strongest Dragon Series spirit. Blade accumulates the power around his sword and unleashes the skill Dragon Eater. This is a wind skill that not only completely crushes the enchanted armor into dust, as it also rips off Ernest's clothes and knocks every student except for Sophie against the wall. Ernest then comes back and asks how the hell is Blade. After looking around, Blade notices what happened and apologizes, claiming that he's an ordinary person. The class ends and it's lunchtime. Ernest is eating alone in her spot. Blade decides to join her and calls his friends to join them, but they all refuse to. Ernest explains that table is reserved for her, but he confuses the situation. He asks if she's being bullied, but she calls him an idiot and reveals that everyone is afraid of her. He wants to know why, but she ignores him. After tasting his food, Blade starts to eat like he never had a meal in his life. She's confused because it's just curry, yet she apologized for telling that he bribed someone to join the school. But Blade didn't even remember that situation. She admits that he has some talent, but Blade is focused on his food. On the other hand, Blade thanks her because she helped him realizes his dream of having friends. She's confused, but he tells that since they're eating together, they're now friends. Ernest gets as red as tomato and tells that she doesn't mind being his friend. Later at night, Ernest gets back to her room and reflects on his words. She initially calls him an idiot, but then starts rolling on her bed, happy that she managed to make her first friend. Suddenly, her sword starts shacking, making her remember her past. When she was younger, she immediately felt an attraction toward her sword. Yet, when she approached, the sword told her to surrender herself to it. Ernest fell into those words and picked up the sword, her hair turned from black to red. And since then, the sword has been filling her mind with words to destroy, slash and burn. The sword repeats those words, but Ernest tells it to shut up. She's the next head of her family and she won't give in to the demonic sword. She manages to calm down the sword and felt determined to get stronger. The next day, they continue their practice lessons, but she's annoyed that her opponent is not taking the fight seriously. This guy is the type of playboy who doesn't want a lady to get hurt. The guy then falls back to activate the power of his lance, which Blade thinks it's amazing, and rushes forward, just to get thrown away like Team Rocket. The guy puts his playboy face and admits defeat, but suddenly, Ernest loses control is about to kill him. She manages to stop the swing in time and calls for her next opponent. Sophie steps in and the two start their battle. She manages to block Ernest's attacks with her punches and even manages to push her back. Ernest is forced to use a fire skill and Sophie admits defeat. She then calls Blade to fight her, but he's worried about her condition. She tells that she's fine and gets into her posture. Yet, she suddenly drops her sword and faints after feeling the sword trying to consume her. Blade manages to catch her in time and takes her to the infirmary. He tries to convince the doctor to make Ernest feel better, just like she did to him after defeating the demon lord. But she explains she cannot do something against spells and curses. Ernest then wakes up, confused about what happened. Blade tries to explain, but she gets startled and tries to get up. Blade stops her and explains everything. Ernest wants to leave, but the doctor tells her to rest. Blade promises that he will take care of Ernest and helps her get back. She says that she can walk by herself, but Blade tells her that she can lean on him because they're friends. But she simply tells him to keep what happened a secret and walks away. Blade then decides to infiltrate in the data system of the academy to get information about her. He finds out that Ernest has the demon sword named Asmodeus. He decides to call her out to talk in private. She misunderstands his intentions, thinking it's something romantic. But he says that he knows the secret about her sword. Outside, he explains that her sword gives her more power, but since the sword has free will, the sword doesn't accept her as its master. He asks how it did happens, and she explains that she found the sword when she was six, and that the sword tried to take over her body, since then she's still trying to battle against the sword urges. Blade then tells the only way to stop it is for the sword to acknowledge her as its owner, but she's afraid to try it, because if she fails, the demon will take her body and kills thousands of innocent people. Yet, Blade tells her that it's okay. She gets mad, but Blade tells her he can handle it, and if it's needed, he will destroy the sword. She decides to believe him and starts the ritual to form a pact. 
Blade watches her from the side, as he sees flames surrounding her body. After finishing the chant, the demon sword increases the flames to test her. Ernest sees herself in front of the demon and she orders it to submit to her. Yet, the demon refuses to surrender forcing them into a fight. The flames start to generate some sort of small demons, wishing to destroy everything. One of the demons tries to attack Blade, but he destroys it with his punch. After watching the scene, Ernest believes that Blade will take care of everything if she fails. She decides to give it her all and decides to go all out against the demon. The two clashes with their powers, and with Blade's support, she manages to win the battle and control the sword. Blade catches Ernest as she falls from the sky and congratulates her for succeeding. From that moment on, Ernest changed her habits. She starts to greet students with a smile instead of being moody, all thanks to her first friend, Blade. The day continues as usual until class starts. Blade ends up practicing against two students, but he simply dodges every single attack. Ernest comes to him and tells him to at least draw his sword against his colleagues. She also mentions that he's disrespecting them because he's not even looking at them while fighting. But Blade simply replies that she looks different. She acts flirty asking how she looks different to him. Blade thinks of all of the moments she was smiling and acting cute, until he simply replies that he doesn't know. Leonard starts attacking Blade while telling him to notice when a girl changes her hairstyle. Of course, Blade didn't even notice it. Ernest reaches a level of depression that says that she didn't want him to notice, but she goes back to serious mode and tells Blade to keep an eye on Sophie. He notices her practicing by herself and asks Ernest why is it. Ernest says that Sophie always practices by herself, but she usually obeys every command she's given. But she never did something she wanted to, except for the time when she told her name to him. Ernest tells him to deal with Sophie, while ordering Leonard to work harder. Blade goes to Sophie, introduces himself, and says that Ernest asked him to watch over her training. Sophie asks if that's a command. Blade ends up confused because that wasn't an order, but she asked him to do it. Still, he simply smiles and tells that he wants to help her. Sophie looks at her fists and says that's all she can use. Blade curiously asks why she doesn't use weapons. She simply replies that she was only taught to use her body to fight. Blade promises to teach her other ways to fight. She asks if it's a command. Blade simply replies he's trying to help a friend, and if she doesn't want to, she doesn't need to learn. She's curious about it and decides to give it a try. Blade prepares to practice with her, but the bell rings, signaling their practical training is over. Blade is flustered because they were about to start. Ernest replies that's because he was flirting. Sophie then looks at Blade and gives him a smile. In the next practical training class, Blade teaches Sophie how to use a sword, but she cannot still cut through the armor. Blade tells her to channel her fighting spirit into the sword, just like she does with her fists. He tells her that a sword is just an extension of her body while demonstrating. She easily understands and manages to cut through the armor. Blade tells that if she keeps going, she will be able to use the sword. He decides to call it for a day, but Sophie asks if she will beat Ernest. Blade replies that getting to Ernest's level won't be easy. Suddenly, Sophie throws the sword back at Blade. He grabs it, but Sophie grabs him and throws him to the floor in the next second. She sits on top of him to restrain him and says this way is stronger. Blade agrees and says that he can't move. She replies while getting her face closer that she wouldn't be in a good mount position if the enemy could move freely. Blade agrees and she tells him that she wants to learn something else from him tomorrow. Blade promises he will do it, but first, he must visit the school principal, if you don't remember, the king. The king asks how school life is going, to which Blade replies that he made some friends. The king feels relieved because Blade became the hero when he was still three years old. Don't ask me how. At this point, the king even considers Blade his best friend. But Blade wants to be friends with people around his age. The king is curious and asks who Blade's friends are. Blade mentions he's been lately closer to Sophie. The king isn't surprised, he already expected that Blade would be interested in her. The two comments on how strong she is, but the king states that she's still incomplete. Blade is confused, but the king explains their goal for her completed form was to surpass Blade. Blade gets mad and asks what this is about. The king mocks him for befriending her without knowing she was part of the artificial great hero project. Blade is once again confused. The king explains that if Blade, the great hero, can exist, then there's also the possibility to create an artificial great hero just like him. He basically explains there's a certain group who used ancient forbidden knowledge to create an artificial hero. They took a test subject with the best aptitude and tried to artificially manifest the great hero's powers. To make it worse, they created several clones of her for that experiment, and they used them to make new experiments and adjustments. Blade is confused about the clones because he thought they were thinking about Sophie. 
the king reveals Sophie's real name is Sophisha Femto. Femto signifies 12, which means she's the 12th clone of Sophisha. Blade's eyes are shaking as he cannot believe the truth. The king continues by saying that the original Sophisha was treated as an object to be experimented on. Blade angrily gets up, but the king explains that he wasn't involved. Plus, he took that organization down. Blade calms down, but the king explains the moment he met Sophie. He took her in and told her that she was free. But she also asked if that was a command, something that hasn't changed since then. Blade rushes back and blames himself because Sophie was robbed of a normal life because they wanted to create a great hero. But now, he's decided to make sure she gets her normal life back. The problem is that he doesn't know what's a normal life too. He goes to the infirmary to talk with his medic friend, who's more interested in seeing his body. He asks her what normal means and what's normal for a kid of his age. She's happy that he's curious and she's willing to teach him everything related to the vigor of youth. And Glad misunderstood her words because I wouldn't. He goes to Leonard and asks what youth does mean and what it involves. Leonard is also dumb and replies that it means love. Blade dashes away and asks his colleagues what is love and what they do when they're in love. One of them replies that love is about going on dates together. As you guess, it's time for the next victim. He goes to Ernest's room and asks about dates. She misunderstands the whole situation, but due to Blade's insistence, she replies that it's couples spending time alone. They talk, walk around, and go shopping. But despite being happily shy about it, she says it's too early for them to go on a date. Blade storms off, telling he will be going on a date. Of course, Ernest wants to know who's the girl stealing her spot. While looking for Sophie, Blade enters heaven, I mean the girl's bathroom, and asks Sophie on a date. She replies if that's an order. It isn't, but he tells that's important. She smiles and agrees. Of course, girls including Ernest decide to spy on the two while mentioning what happened. The girls are still calling Ernest the Empress, and she tells them to simply call her Ernest. The girls refuse, but Ernest explains their comrades united with one single goal. To keep an eye on Blade and prevent him from doing funny business, I wonder what she means by that. Sophie arrives at the meeting spot on time and tells Blade she doesn't have an idea of what a date is. Blade replies with, don't worry I've planned everything. Of course, his agenda sounds more like a mission briefing. The girls think this is too detailed and that it really sounds like a date. Sophie holds onto his arm and they start walking. Ernest and the girls don't like that interaction and end up losing them. Turns out Blade planned to walk around the city, eat some ice cream, visit some spots, run around, and even feed the fish. They then go to an arcade to play the punching game. Ernest and the girls are pretty jealous and want to stop them. Why you ask? Because they destroy the bloody machine. Blade becomes a bit more romantic and the two have to drink from the same fruit at the same time with their straws. But since it's hard to sip, Sophie asks him to get closer to her. Suddenly, Blade jumps away when their faces touch. She asks him what is wrong, but he doesn't understand. Sophie tells him she cannot complete the mission of finishing the drink by herself. He replies that he understands, but his heart is going faster than a race car. They shyly get near each other to finish the drink, and Sophie tells him to get closer. Blade's heart is reaching its limit, but Ernest and the girls are annoyed because they haven't been noticed despite sitting one table away. Ernest's mind is also racing, annoyed by seeing them close. After moving forward with their date, Blade finally starts to feel like someone is following them. They still ignore it and try to move forward with their activities. But Blade notices they're a bit late, Sophie says that it's okay and they will take a shortcut. And by that I mean, climbing a building, and then jumping among the city buildings. Then end the date sitting by a fountain, where Sophie reveals she had fun today. She then asks why he decided to call her on a date. He wants to tell the truth but he can't, so he replies that it's because she's his friend. Sophie asks if they're really friends because friends don't keep secrets from each other. Blade thinks he was caught, but she then says that she hasn't told him something. She decides to reveal to him that she isn't a normal human. She explains the whole incomplete test subject story and shows the power she got from it. She says the real hero can change the laws of physics, but she cannot control the power. She falls down and says that she wanted to increase her body weight by a thousand times. But since she cannot control her power, she actually increased it by 10,000. She also reveals that she can stop time, but she can only use the hero powers for 10 seconds. After hearing her whole story, Blade tells her that he won't also keep any secrets from her. She wants to listen to it, and Blade reveals that they used to call him the great hero. Sophie doesn't reply and Blade explains that he lost his powers. Since she's silent, he asks if she knew already. She replied that she didn't, but she felt something familiar coming from him. 
he apologizes to her, because he is the reason she became a test subject for this curse power and lost her normal life. Sophie doesn't understand the curse part. Blade explains that the hero's power is a curse. He never wanted to be the great hero, but he had no choice but to fight because they told him that he could use the power to save people. He started to fight monsters when he was only three years old. That was the time his powers had awakened. He became strong and almost died several times, but there were still people he couldn't save. People would be angry at him when he couldn't save their loved ones. Blade starts to cry and Sophie runs toward him to comfort him. She says that even if didn't he want to be it, he was still the great hero. She reveals that after being rescued by the king, she went out on a journey to find out who she was. She mentions all the cities he saved and all the people he also saved. He holds her tight while she tells him to be proud. He says that's impossible, but Sophie replies that she is proud that she took part in the artificial great hero experiment, because she wants to become someone like him. After hearing those words, Blade decides that he won't be haunted by his past anymore. The two hold hands and promise that they will keep his real identity a secret. Blade and his fellow classmates were enjoying their lunch in the cafeteria when Ernest mentions Blade had food all over his face. Sophie kindly helped clean his face, making Ernest complain out of jealousy. Her new friends arrive and ask if they can join them. They end up joining them and one of the girls asks for Blade's opinion on their outfits. Blade is confused, but Ernest interrupts and congratulates the group for being promoted in class to their class. Blade is still confused, and the students mention only s rank students can dress freely. The girl asks what Blade thinks again, but he thinks she's cold with that outfit. Of course, Leonard is here to pick up girls and tries his best. Ernest tells him to stay down and asks if Blade knew about the news. The king is bringing a magical beast to the school to improve the training. Blade doesn't care about it, which surprises Ernest. He mentions that he couldn't expect less from the old fart king. Suddenly, the ground starts shaking, making the students in panic. Sophie tells Blade they should take everyone to the shelter, but he rushes with his plate still in his hand. They find a dragon, and Blade asks if that's a magical beast. Blade slowly walks forward, and the dragon moves into him after seeing him. Ernest prepared to fight, but Sophie stopped her. Blade then suddenly jumps into the air, and knocks the dragon down with a punch while telling it to sit. Ernest cannot understand what's going on. How did Blade deal with the dragon with only one punch? He replies that this dragon is still young, and he must have been scared while being dragged here. He asks if the dragon is hungry and throws his plate inside its mouth. But it's too spicy for the dragon and Blade laughs. The students were amazed at Blade's ability to pacify the dragon with a single blow. Blade tried to downplay it mentioning this is normal and everyone could do it. Nobody believed him. He says that it's not a great dragon or an ancient one, it's just a baby dragon. Everyone stepped back, scared of him, when the dragon suddenly starts to shine. Ernest tells Blade to look behind where he sees a little girl. She jumps on him calling him father, but Blade doesn't understand. She claims she's been looking for him and now wants to play. Blade replies that he's not her father, but he will help her find her parents later. He then asks Ernest where the dragon went. She tries to explain the dragon became that little girl, but he says that's impossible. Despite Blade's attempts to convince her otherwise, the girl persisted in her belief that he was her father. Ernest explained the dragon had shapeshifted into the girl, and Sophie confirmed this, finally convincing Blade. The girl jumped on him and he asks why is she calling him father. She ignores his question, mentioning his punch is amazing, and she couldn't expect less from her father. She clings to him, asking to play, and Blade doesn't know what to do. They then decided to let Blade care for her to prevent her from going on a rampage. While bathing the little girl, whom he named Ku, asked why he gave her that name. Blade explained that he chose after a strong knight who always kept promises. This pleased Ku, because dragons also keep a promise, even if it costs their life. Ernest interrupted the bath and got shy after seeing his chest. He asks if she did learn anything about the girl. She mentions that magical beasts like dragons are creatures who seek strength. Once they're defeated, their flesh decays, but they leave a fragment of their soul with their knowledge. That fragment then can be incarnated as another entity and copies the shape of the being that defeated them. In short, Blade concludes a dragon can take a human form if defeated by a human. Ernest explains it's rare because most humans cannot defeat a dragon. Blade realizes she's talking about his strength, and he wondered if Ku had been defeated by a human in her past life. Ernest realizes that Blade decided to name the dragon. The girl revealed herself, mentioning she likes her name. Ernest sees Blade was taking a shower with Ku and kicks his face while calling him a pervert. The following day, Ernest was still annoyed, especially because Ku was sitting on Blade's lap. 
Ku asked him to feed her, and Blade did it. Ku mentions she's capable of feeding herself, but being fed by Blade makes it taste better. Claire thinks Ku is cute and tries to feed her. But Ku becomes aggressive, mentioning she won't be friends with weak humans. Blade tells Ku that she scared Claire, but Ku replies that he should only pay attention to her, his daughter. She mentions that he must give her a good morning kiss and she must sit on his lap for him to feed her during mealtime, to which he agrees. Every girl is shocked and asks if Blade kisses her in the morning. He mentions he never did it. Ku then mentions Blade spends his time staring at mature female bodies, which she thinks it's unacceptable. The girls take this seriously and confront him, and the boys backstab him. They claim he is guilty and punish him by leaving him alone during training. Ernest recommended that their classmates not worry about him. Blade then notices Ku walking by and asks if she wants to join him. She happily joins, mentioning she doesn't need to train, but since he asked, she will show off power. The group that just joined their class was told to partner with Blade. Jessica said she wanted to become a spy and asked who could teach her, Blade recommended Sophie. But Ku felt like he was ignoring him and left. He tries to call her up, but she already disappeared. Ku was walking around school and noticed a group of students training. They asked if she wanted to join them and become friends. But Ku replied they were too weak to fight her. She ran away and bumped into Blade. He noticed she was feeling down and asked what was wrong. She dismissed it and told him she was starving. He told her they were going to get some curry. She hugged him and said he knew her too well. After their meal, Blade watches Ku fall asleep. He pokes her face and she holds his finger. Ernest knocks on his door and the two go outside. He explains to her that dragons are tormented by their parents when they're born. They only do that because the child only recognizes their parents due to their strength. Ernest asks if that's the reason why Ku behaves like that. He replies that Ku has been alone since she was born. Ernest tells him that he cannot pretend to be Ku's father for longer. Blade agrees, but he's afraid that Ku will end up truly alone in the world. He asks if Ernest knows how much it hurts to be alone. She then realizes what he's trying to say and now knows that Blade is serious when he decided to take care of Ku. She then asks if Sophie is reassured, revealing that she was listening to everything. Ernest and Sophie were worried about him, and Blade says that things are going well with Ku. The girls head back, to avoid any scandalous rumors. But when Blade enters his room, he notices Ku isn't there. He goes to the roof and asks her what's wrong. Ku replies that looking at the moons calms her down. She sees them as representations of parent and child. Blade understands what's going on and asks if she doesn't want to make friends. Ku says he's wrong because dragons are stronger than humans, both physically and mentally. Dragons did not form friendships and they live and die alone. She doesn't need friends, she only needs her parent, Blade. Blade plays it around and tells she's indeed strong. The next day, Blade tried to make the king babysit Ku, but it didn't go as planned. The king scared Ku, and she ran off, leaving Blade frustrated with the king's antics. Blade returned to his room and heard Ku's voice. He peeked inside to see her playing with toys and acting out a drama with them. He noticed that each toy imitated a personality from one of his friends. Ku's play portrayed Blade seeking friendship from everyone for her sake. She then starts mentioning names of students that Blade never talked to. He realizes those are the other students they passed by while walking around. The toy named Blade then mentions that his daughter managed to make 108 friends. Blade realizes that Ku wishes to have friends but claims she doesn't. He walks away, disappointed that he never noticed it. Ernest approached him, offering to help search for Ku, but she was stunned when Blade started banging his head against the wall repeatedly. She stopped him she asked him what was wrong. Blade explained that it was challenging for Ku to make friends because dragons didn't see weaker beings as equals. To be Ku's friend, they would have to defeat her in a fight. He felt powerless to help Ku find the friendship she desired. Ernest urged Blade to rely on her and others instead of trying to handle everything on his own. They made their way to meet the lower classes and ask for their help in the fight. Blade talked about Ku, explaining her desire to befriend them and asking for their assistance in defeating her. But the students knew they couldn't defeat a dragon. Blade begged on his knees for them to become Ku's friends, and Ernest repeated his actions. The remaining students from S class also arrive and beg on their knees. They want Ku to finally get some friends. The students couldn't believe their eyes and ended up agreeing with the request. The next day, everyone waited for Ku's arrival at the arena. She comes in her dragon form and notices the king watching from afar, enjoying the scene. The secretary asks if a dragon will acknowledge defeat if it's taken down by a large group. But the king thinks it will because dragons know humans work in groups. The king feels sad because Blade won't join the fight. But Blade almost tells Ku that it's okay if she burns the king into crispy royal bacon. He then pats her head and mentions that she couldn't fight when she was captured because of a trap. 
But this time, there are no traps, she can show everyone her strength. She breathes from fire, and everyone prepares to start the battle. But of course, the students start running away when Ku uses her fire breath and her tail. Ernest uses her broken sword to hit Ku and yells at the student to remember their plan. Somehow they recover their brain and follow the strategy. They surround Ku from all sides and dodge the tail attack, well, some do, giving the ranged weapon squad a chance to attack. Blade is hyped up because the plan seems to work, while the Trash King is having fun. Ernest orders the long-range squad to attack when the other squad falls back. The students combine their attacks to hit Ku from all sides. The King's secretary, or whatever she is, ends up being impressed by the students who attack from Ku's blind spots. The King thinks they're working well together, but there's a problem. Ordinary attacks cannot damage a bloody dragon. Blade starts to get worried, yet Ku isn't holding back. Some students are already calling 911 while others are preparing their casket. Ku uses fire while also going Hulk smash. The king feels like Blade is waiting for something, but mentions the battle will end before that. Ku attacks a group with fire, but they dodge. Blade yells this is their chance. Sophie takes this chance to run and punch the hell out of Ku, while Ernest uses her magic sword to deal a fire attack. The king is impressed, mentioning they finally dealt some damage, but Blade's plan still failed. Yet, Blade mentions this is enough because Ku lost awareness of her surroundings. The floor suddenly seems to break and Ku ends up being pinned against the floor. The king doesn't understand, he thought they were fighting fair and square. Blade mentions they're fighting fairly because the trap was placed during the battle, not before. Turns out Leonard was the one digging a hole after the battle began. The king realizes the students have been stalling for time but it's still not enough to win. Blade already knows it and mentions the real battle will begin. The students charge forward, and Ku tries to stop them by breathing fire. Ernest uses her Asmodeus sword again, but the sword initially refuses because it's becoming weak. She calls him a wimp and uses fire once again to attack Ku. Leonard finally joins the fight, but Ku's scales are so strong that he gets projected back. But this guy doesn't get his timing right. He's literally trying to flirt with Ernest right now, mentioning he's been running 10 miles a day every day like she asked him to. Ernest doesn't even remember that. Forget about that guy, because Ku starts to fly to get out of that situation. Ernest attacks again, to force Ku down, and Sophie punches her with her artificial hero gravity manipulation skill to pin Ku down. The king now gets hyped up again, and Blade shouts this is the right time. Everyone is tired as hell, and Ernest complains that he's making them work hard. She calls forth for more power from her sword, who's shaking because he cannot take it anymore. But Ernest doesn't care, the sword starts channeling all its power. The king is impressed because he didn't know there was a capable student in their school. But Blade explains it's not only Ernest's powers. He mentions that most people are weak as ants, but with every student, they can share their power with Ernest to give her a bigger power. All the students mention they want to become friends with Ku and ask Ernest to give her a beating. After channeling all her power, Ernest attacks Ku, creating a huge explosion. Meanwhile, Blade tells Ku to take a good look because that's the powers that humans have. Ku returns to her human form and looks like she's not only exhausted but also traumatized for life. She's tearing down because she lost, but Blade comes to pat her head and comfort her. She apologized for disappointing him with her defeat. She thinks he will abandon her for being weak just like dragons do. But Blade mentions he won't abandon her and corrects her. She isn't weak, she only lost because humans were stronger. Following his instructions, she ends up accepting defeat and Blade asks if she can be friends with everyone. She reveals her attitude, replying that if they insist that much, she will become their friend. Yet, Blade chops her on the head, and she shyly asks everyone to become her friend. Everyone smiles and accepts it. In the aftermath, the secretary asks the king what is he scheming. He simply replies that he wants his students to grow up. But with this demonstration, he now wants to take arrange a new training method. Basically, he got his hands on a virtual reality type of magic made by what you all love, science. And he's now trying to build it into the school. Since that last fight, everyone became close friends with Ku. She now sits on others' laps, and Claire tries to feed her. Of course, those two together seem weird as hell. While eating, Blade notices something and asks Ernest if there's something different about her. You'll realize the mistake he just made after looking at her. Everyone is startled and tries to call him off, mentioning he cannot say that. Sophie even calls him despicable, while the others mention she's not different. What the hell do you mean she isn't different? She was a hot waifu, and now looks like she ate Ku's dragon form. Leonard tries to be the good guy, but Blade is a sigma. He calls her the three-letter word. Ernest starts tearing down, well I guess it wasn't the three-letter word, he probably called her a whale. 
she cannot take it anymore and runs while crying. Dada say that was quite an earthquake. Everyone proclaims Blade guilty, but since he doesn't have common sense, he doesn't understand it. Blade ends up being quite depressed for the next couple days because Ernest didn't leave her room. Ku tried to comfort him but it wasn't enough. The girls mentioned that Ernest could even stop being his friend. Blade freaks out, he wants to be her friend. He asks the girls if Ernest would forgive him if he apologized. He tries to run into her room, but Claire stops him. She asks if Blade doesn't know why Ernest is mad at him. To be fair, if it's not that, not even I know. Claire mentions that Blade will probably make Ernest even angrier, so the girls tag along. They knock at Ernest's door and tell her that Blade came to apologize, but there's no reply. They picklock the door and get inside Ernest's dark room. They see her on the floor, seems like she's crying. They ask if she's alright, but Ku has a different reaction. She mentions it looks tasty and asks for some. When the group turns on the light, they find out Ernest was stuffing herself with three boxes of pastries. She even tells them to not look at her. Imagine the audacity. She tells the desserts are tasty, and Blade calls them the culprit. Ernest then explains that she's been feeling hungry all the time since their last fight with Ku, and seems like she never realized that delicious pastries existed before. Blade is more interested in what really matters. He asks if she wants to burn some hot calories. Okay, he didn't, he asked if they were still friends. She replies that she didn't want him to see her like that. To be fair, I don't think anyone wants. Since everything is okay, Blade is like, cool I'm out then. Claire and Jessica stop him, and tell him that if he leaves, Ernest will become a lost cause. So, he needs to say something nice and stuff, you know, tell a lie. He gets the idea, and only makes it worse, by telling Ernest that it's good that she's enjoying the food. He's a lost cause, and Jessica begs Leonard for his help. As you might expect, this guy tries to flirt with Ernest while mentioning that he's too poor to pay for her restaurant bill. Blade learns from him, and gives into his flirty personality. He grabs Ernest's shoulder and asks if this is something she cannot deal with alone. He tells her that she should ask for their help, they will train her. Ernest tears down and feels motivated to give another bite in that donut. The only problem is that Big Mama cannot exercise properly anymore. She runs with Blade and Koo, but at this point, if they stop moving they will be going at the same speed as her. They continue with several exercises with Blade and Koo trying to motivate her, but she's too weak. To make it worse, her special diet meal is literally half an egg, two broccoli, and some small fish. The girls around her are eating full plates and tell her to cut her calories. She even tries to burn some fat later in the sauna, but she cannot take it anymore. When she gets out, the girls are ready to weigh her. She gets on top and crushes it. Turns out, she didn't lose weight, she got more. Blade is curious to know the result, but the girls knock him out. Jessica tells Ernest she must have gained muscle from training because that's exactly what happens right. Claire then starts to get the right ideas, like finding a way to raise her metabolic rate. That gives Ernest an idea, so she asks for Blade's help because she wants to try something a bit drastic. She gives him a sword and explains they need to use the testing ground because it's protected by a magic barrier. She pulls her Asmodeus sword out and asks if Blade can praise her if she manages to pull this off and lose some weight. Blade answers yes and she gets filled with motivation. She tells him that she will be counting on him if something happens and he's like sure. She then channels all her power into her sword and orders it to consume her body. The sword surrounds her with some huge flames. Their friends notice the huge fire and come mentioning they've been looking for them. Jessica asks if that's Ernest, and Blade tells everyone to have faith in her. Suddenly, the fire goes down and Ernest's body is back to slim. The only problem is that she has a pair of horns and black eyes, not to mention her new underwear is made of fire. Turns out Asmodeus took this chance to take over her body, and is now prepared to destroy the world. That's until Ernest talks again to the demon, explaining she only gave her body fat, not her body, all for the sake of her diet. The demon thinks about it and realizes that this demon's form consumes too much energy. It takes 1 million calories to maintain it for an hour, making Ernest happy about it, until she gets dizzy and collapses because she's hungry. She reaches beast mode and even grows a tail. Claire tells her to not lose humanity, but Ernest rushes to attack her. Blade steps forward and uses his wind skill to stop the fire and return Ernest to normal. She later wakes up in his arms and he tells her that she did great. They return to their normal lives until they go to Ernest's room because she's missing for the whole day. Just to find out she once again is eating like a pig. A few days later, Blade returns to the nursery to be examined by the doctor. She tells him that he's slowly recovering, about 30%. He's curious if he can use his hero powers again but explains that he will die if he uses 30% of his full power. He leaves the office and walks around the school and hears Claire calling him. 
She wants to introduce him to her friend Maria, but Blade interrupts her because he remembers she was part of the magic unit when the students fought Ku. But as you guess, Blade's a very considerate person, mentioning Maria tripped all the time during training and threw her magic spells in the wrong direction. Literally, this guy is becoming a pure bully. She accepts her fate, mentioning she's clumsy but Claire mentions Marie has a favor to ask him. Turns out this girl wants Blade to kill her. Well, she explains that she's not human and she wants Blade to kill her if she somehow loses control. Everyone is surprised, yet, Blade simply confirms that she's a night demon. Yes, Blade already knew about it. She reveals her pointy ears while saying there's something else inside her. No, it's not what you're thinking. It's just a magical beast. I think this doesn't make it better either. So yeah, that thing is powerful, and her cup of British leaf water magically breaks. She worriedly apologizes, mentioning she cannot control her strength. Claire tries to calm her down, but she explains that she has been losing control of herself since she fought against Ku. The only problem is that she has nowhere to go if she gets kicked from the academy. Claire explains they came from the same school, and that Marie's parents are gone. That's why Marie wants to deal with those powers to find a place where she belongs. Blade accepts for one reason, he wants to deal with her inside thingy. Okay, for real now, he doesn't have parents. Sophie and Ku join, and they will probably create the orphan school club. But the rest also joins, including Ernest, who as you might notice, she is now slim again. Now all those kids in Africa can eat again. Their plan is to go to the training ground, set up a barrier, and stuff. Blade wants Marie to release her power so she can learn how to control it. She refuses to, but he explains if Ernest could do it, then she can also do it. After some encouragement from Ernest, she ends up putting her faith on Blade. She first drops one bracelet, which ends up reducing her power by half. It really smashes the ground, until they notice there are three more, and a necklace that reduces her power by ten. This girl is literally the demon lord. Ernest realizes they're in deep stuff and tries to stop her. Too late, Marie's power is unleashed, and she freaks out because someone is coming out. Blade tells her to believe them, and she smiles before transforming into what it seems a succubus, but turns out it's the real demon lord. The demon lord laughs, ordering them to kneel and all the stuff. Yes, mommy. I mean, she's celebrating her rebirth because she will control the world and stuff. Sophie asks if that's really the demon lord. Blade tells her it's not, but the crest on her head means otherwise. Ernest quickly pulls her demon sword and transforms into a demon to attack Marie, but the demon lord quickly deals with her. Leonard comes forward just to meet the same fate. Sophie decides to jump on her back and use Ultima Gravity to pull her down, while Ku uses a fire spell in her dragon form. Sophie collapses after exhausting all her magic power to restrain her, and Ku launches her attack, but the demon lord stops it with her hand, turns into a crystal and throws it back. After seeing all his comrades collapse, Blade grabs his sword and rushes to hit her. The Demon Lord is confused because he never unsheathed his sword and asks if he's trying to take her out alive. She thinks he's a funny guy and tells him to fight her seriously, or she will kill him. She uses a wind spell to project him against the barrier and says that she will kill him if he doesn't take it seriously. Blade knows he's still recovering but he cannot give up yet. He finally decides to take it seriously, but she manages to stop his attacks with her bare hands. He steps back and she uses a fire spell asking him to not die right away. He uses his sword to block the attack, but his blade ends up destroyed. Ernest gets up, showing how hot she can be. I mean, she tells him to use her demonic sword to fight the demon lord. Asmodeus tells him that he doesn't want to do it, but since Ernest ordered him, he doesn't have many options. The demon lord thinks she will now have an amusing fight but Blade couldn't care less. His goal is to finish it with his next blow. She mocks him for his words and tells him to show her what he can do. Blade channels his power, but Asmodeus tells him to stop because he cannot handle Blade's immense power. Of course, Blade ignores it and uses his full power against the Demon Lord. She manages to block it with a barrier, thinking it was too simple until she notices her spell breaking apart. She cannot believe her eyes, and Blade manages to defeat her with his full power. He's happy that nobody ended up dying, but he soon collapses. He later wakes up in the nurse's office where the doctor quickly hugs him while calling him an idiot. Despite being injured, he's enjoying life. She asks him why she's always making her worry about him and explains that he died for some seconds. If she didn't arrive in time, he would never wake up again. She calls him a liar because he promised that he would never make her cry again, but he failed. He apologizes and asks about the others. The doctor reveals they're all safe, and Claire is treating them. He then asks about Marie, who is also alive. A day later, everything returns to normal. Well, not everything. Turns out Maria is still in her demon lord form. 
She greets Blade as the hero, but he tries to shut her up. She now has something to use against him in the future, and Blade tells Maria she should stop. She then explains that Maria is a different personality, and Blade asks the Demon Lord for her name, but she was never given one. Blade decides to check it with the king, who reveals that he was aware of Maria's identity. He explains Maria's mother was a human, and her father is the former Demon Lord, the one Blade has defeated. The Demon Lord's daughter quickly adapted to her new life, especially because she claims to be an ordinary young girl. Jessica complains mentioning she just wants to wear cute clothes. Yet, the Demon Lord's daughter simply flashes at the boys. The students began calling her Mao, and she says that she one day wants a rematch against Blade. She heads to class, and Claire gets worried that she will never see Maria again. At night, Mao knocks on Blade's window while Ku is sleeping. She wants to invite him on a date and grabs him to fly him up. She keeps calling him the great hero and mentions that Maria spent most of her time looking at the moon. Blade asks how old is she, and she mentions that she became self-aware five years ago. Blade is confused because she's five, but she explains magical beasts don't care about age. She takes him to the roof, saying a lady doesn't want to be treated as a child. Blade is confused with the lady part, and she's like, can't you see? As you know, Blade is too dumb to understand. She feels bad, because she feels attached to him, but he doesn't notice her. She then reveals that she only stayed in this school because of him. He thought she was enjoying her school life, which she also admits, but she mentions that a magical beast always looks for strength. She admits being attached to him, but she doesn't understand why, especially because she feels that he's weaker than he was in the last couple of days. Blade reveals that if he uses 15% of his power he will die. She then says that he's not worthy of being killed by her right now, but she won't leave this school until she kills him. She holds his hand and reveals that she has been thinking of a theory that she perhaps loves him. Blade is confused, but she says it's only a possibility, she just wants to test it out. She blushes as she holds his hand and asks if he wants to be her partner. Yet, Blade is too young, dumb, and innocent to understand what it means. Turns out she also doesn't, because she's five. Blade thinks it would be easier for them to go to the testing ground and fight each other until they're satisfied. She refuses because of his current condition, plus, she cannot take out the necklace that restrains her power. She explains Maria's consciousness is still inside her and stops her from taking it off. Blade asks about Maria, and Mao explains that she's hiding in the deepest parts of her mind. She mentions that Maria's heart is filled with dark shadows because of her past. She was feared and bullied by humans while she was still a child, and she was forced to hide away with her mother, who always believed her husband would come back. But Maria never believed her father would return. Eventually, her mother died, and Maria's mind was filled with doubts. She thought that her father never loved her mother and abandoned them. She thought the Demon Lord was the reason of their suffering. That's when Mao was born, as a way to escape the pain Maria always felt. She says that Maria may never appear again. Yet, she explains that she only told him this because Blade is closer to a demon than to humanity, something she likes about him. Blade calls it something of the past, and they return to their rooms. A few days later, they studied Mao's necklace, just to find out it's not a ceiling item. Mao explains she's being restricted by the necklace, and Blade asks for more information about it. Eliza, the one performing the research mentions that it seems some sort of recording device. Basically, that necklace has some sort of message for Maria. Mao mentions that Marie received it from her mother, yet, Eliza mentions that the recorded message could bring Maria back and destroy the Demon Lord. Despite the possibilities, Mao decides to accept to play the message because she cares about Maria. Eliza uses a spell to activate the recording, and Claire mentions they could have become friends if Maria and Mao stayed alive. Mao mentions that the ones who remain will be their friends. Eliza orders Mao to open up the necklace and it projects an image of the previous Demon Lord. The Demon Lord initially tries to apologize for leaving Marie and her mother because he had to fight against the great hero. He didn't want them to follow him into a path filled with blood. He left Marie's mother when he noticed that she was pregnant, he had already decided the name for the child, and ordered Marie's mother to tell the kid that he was dead. Mao finds Marie deep in her find, and asks how long she will be hiding. Marie takes Mao's hand, and they listen to their father's message, revealing that he will love both Marie and her mother forever. Mao starts to cry, revealing she cannot control her body because Marie is also crying in her mind. She mentions that she and Marie are fighting to see who gets to survive, and that Marie is about to destroy her. Mao tells the group to call Marie's name, and the group follows the instructions. Mao loses consciousness and gets on her knees, and Marie regains control of the body. She ends up asking Blade to duel her, and she turns into Mao. Turns out they managed to find a way to coexist because Marie wished to. 
but their fight turns out to be strange. Seems like Blade is more interested in flirting with Mao instead of fighting, despite her being five. After having a meal, Blade and his friends are heading back to their school. On the way, they want to get some yummy pudding, but there's a big cart stuck in the road. A lady is trying to move it. Ernest suggests she should use the main road instead. Suddenly, Ernest notices that this lady isn't just any lady, she's a centaur. Blade knows her, and her name is Dion. Dion wants to call Blade the great hero, but Blade asks her not to because it's a special secret. Ernest wonders if they know each other, and Blade hints that they do. Dion says she's known Blade for ages and tries not to spill the secret about him being the hero. Blade then asks Dion about what she's carrying in her cart. He says he'd love to help her with it. Dion is thankful and wonders if the others with Blade are his team. Blade simply says they're his good pals. Together, they help Dion move the king's special delivery. Once it's done, the king has another task for Dion. He says she's going to be a teacher at Rosewood School from now on. This surprises Ernest, but the king believes Dion is a great choice for a teacher. He also hints that Blade knows just how talented she is. The advanced class then watch Dion with some strong metal blocks called God Iron in front of her. Dion uses some special power to break these blocks. Sophie is surprised because she thought these blocks shouldn't be broken. After showing her skills, Dion says she's ready to start the lesson. But Blade suggests Dion should tell everyone about herself first. Dion shares her name, Dion the Demon Lance. Ernest thinks for a moment. He wonders if she's the famous General Dion from a big group of horse soldiers. Everyone is amazed that such a skilled person is going to teach them. Ernest asks Dion if she might have met the great hero. Dion mentions something about meeting the hero a long time ago. This gets Ernest thinking about how old Dion might be. A little later, Ernest and Blade are walking around in town. Suddenly, Ernest spots a shimmering thing flying above them. Blade isn't sure what it is. Ernest tells him it's a Cymurg, which is a special creature considered one of the four magical animals from their land. They wonder why such a creature is in the city. Blade mentions that as long as they don't upset it, the Cymurg shouldn't bother them. However, the Cymurg suddenly goes after a cart. Blade reminds Ernest to stay calm, but they soon notice another Cymurg. They both guess the two creatures might be a pair, and maybe they were after something in the wagon. Blade suspects the king might have answers about this strange event. The story then shifts to Ernest asking the king if he's hiding something. Blade explains to the king about the Cymurgs and the wagon, especially since Dion was near one at that time. Ernest is eager to know what was so special about that wagon's content. It turns out the king had taken an egg belonging to the Cymurgs. Blade believes that's why the creatures are upset. The king's helper suggests the king clarify everything, as the situation is tense. The king then explains that there are certain conditions needed for a Cymurg egg to hatch. First, the egg needs to be at the same level as an ancient tree that's been around for 10,000 years. Secondly, the setting sun has to shine directly on it right as it's ready to hatch. He adds that the Cymurg parents aren't the best at choosing safe spots for their eggs, implying that the egg might not have hatched if he hadn't taken it. Ernest figures out that the king is attempting to teach them a lesson. The king suggests he's doing this as a training exercise for his students. He adds that the Cymurg's egg won't hatch unless they help. So, the heroes need to protect the egg until it's ready to hatch the next day. Blade then shares their plan. They aren't trying to defeat the Cymurg parents, but they need to distract them until sunset. The plan is to hide the egg, and when it's the right time, they'll take it to the top of a tall tower using an elevator. This way, the egg can hatch safely. Blade encourages everyone to believe in themselves, but if they doubt, he assures them he believes in each one. As they start their plan, they notice the Cymurgs attacking another wagon. The good news is the people in that area have already moved to safety. Leonard bravely attempts to fend off a Cymurg using his lance, but the creature avoids him. Clay manages to save Jessica from another attack, though when Jessica tries to retaliate, her efforts don't harm the creature. Some students then use strong wires, called God Iron, hoping to trap the Cymurg, but it's so powerful that it flies off, taking parts of buildings with it. Amidst all this, Claire is busy helping those who are hurt, and she narrowly avoids an attack from a Cymurg. Ku comes to the rescue, but she struggles against the creature. Maria transforms into the Demon Lord and tries to fend off the Cymurg but her efforts aren't effective. Meanwhile, Ernest powers up and confronts the Cymurg, which then fights back. The story then shifts to students moving an egg to a tower. However, the elevator they use stops in the middle. Spotting the egg, the Cymurg becomes alert. The group encourages Blade to protect the egg while they deal with the creature. As Blade moves towards the egg, he encounters Dion. 
she offers to let him ride on her back to get there faster. Even though the king told Dion not to help, she argues that giving Blade a lift doesn't really count as helping with her hands. Blade remembers his friend's advice to trust them and keep going, which reminds him of old times. Dion comforts Blade, telling him he's not alone anymore. Even though Blade once battled the Demon Lord by himself, he now has many friends, including Dion. Trying to take the egg to the tower's top proves tough for Blade because the egg is quite heavy. With Dion's help, they push the egg up to the top where the king is waiting for them. Another Cymurg attempts to snatch the egg, but the king steps in. He tells the creature that a past favor will be returned with a new beginning. The king also mentions how a Cymurg once rescued him, and with Blade's help, he can now repay that kindness. Blade wishes the king had shared the story with him earlier. They notice the sea creature is getting upset. Sophie uses her special skills to calm the creature, while Blade tries his powerful Dragon Eater move. But it doesn't work, and both Blade and Sophie tumble down. Just then, the creature's egg opens up, revealing two baby creatures inside. Blade is puzzled why the baby creatures are looking at him so closely, but Sophie thinks it's because they see him as a guardian. Ernest is amazed, joking that Blade now has a bigger family. A bit later, the two of them ride on the baby creatures. Ernest is a little nervous, but Blade advises her to just enjoy the ride, feeling happy about his new companions. A week later, the school seemed to be all dark and empty. Blade walks through the corridor with his sword drenched in blood as he remembers all the people he defeated on his way in. There he meets Sophie, revealing she always wanted to go in an all-out fight against him. She wonders if she can beat him if she doesn't hold her power back. She activates her power to stop time and lands three hits on Blade. But after backing up, she notices that Blade doesn't even move. She wonders why she didn't defeat him. Blade explains that she can attack him several times, but if her hits deal no damage to him, he then pushes her against the wall and reveals he used a technique to momentarily increase his body toughness. And since she stopped time, the technique was active the whole time. Blade then pierces his sword through her stomach and wonders why he's still doing this despite being an ordinary person now. He raises up and shouts to the king to stop what's going on because he believes this is all a spell or a trick. The king shows up in a hologram and reveals this isn't a trick. This is virtual reality. I gotcha there, didn't I? The king is all happy because of this new technology and tells Blade to use his real power because nobody will be hurt. The demon lord and Ku are having the time of their life fighting each other. The king also mentions this is the best way of practical training ever created. So, his goal is to improve the students' skills by using this technology because they can fight until their virtual reality death. Blade calls this a sick joke and asks if there isn't a way to make it easier to distinguish between what's virtual and what's real. He thinks this is too realistic and thinks there are some people who will return to the real world thinking they're still inside virtual reality. And those people can slaughter their own friends, thinking it's fake. The king realizes that would be a problem and pushes a lever. The lever changes the background to something like Alice in Wonderland. The king then tells them to continue their fights to the death in this new setting. This is a literal battle royale, where the last person standing gets the right to use the virtual reality however they want. Yes, you can finally score a date. Without many options, Blade decides to end this as fast as possible. Leonard is running, happy that he gets to face Ernest, just to be sliced in half. This girl became a literal psycho inside the virtual world and starts stabbing Leonard several times. After Leo disappears, she starts moving, wondering where Blade is. Talking about our boy, he's just walking around, watching how Jessica and Claire fight against two guys. The guys are all happy because the two never defeated them while they were still in the lower class. So, this is pretty much an easy job. The girls refuse to give up, and Jessica asks why the guy refuses to lose to them. The boys become embarrassed, you know what's in their heads, and Jessica takes the opportunity to attack and defeat one of the boys. Claire also strikes the other one and they finally score their first win against them. But there's a problem, Ernest is there dragging her sword, happy that Blade is in the area. She reveals that killing people is fun. Seriously, first, she cannot contain her weight, and now she cannot contain her psycho vibes. She calls herself stupid for holding herself back all this time. Blade then recalls that he made her a promise that he would cut her down if she ever went berserk. Just a swing of his sword destroys everything around him. Ernest rushes against him, but Blade randomly swings his sword to create a wind current that stops her. Seconds later, Blade wakes up in the real world with all students staring at him. The king laughs, mentioning that Blade was the last man standing, as expected. Jessica and Claire don't even know what the hell he just did at the end, but they at least didn't feel any pain. Ernest is crying like a little girl because she can't believe that she went full psycho mode inside. 
Blade even mocks her, mentioning how she was laughing like a villain. She yells at him to shut up because he's overpowered, despite his claims of being ordinary. The king continues to laugh, thinking that his brilliant idea is giving them the joy of youth. But Ernest complains about the trouble they have faced because of this. The king continues to laugh, as expected, unreliable as hell. Blade approaches the king and starts messing around with the virtual reality system. The king tells him to enjoy his reward until he notices what Blade is doing. Blade is inserting data of ferocious demons, creating booby-trapped floors, and all the stuff you expect in an apocalypse. Blade then activates the system, and the king asks if those settings aren't too extreme for him, but tells him that it's okay and puts the virtual reality system on the king's head. He then tells the king's assistant to make him respawn every time the king dies. She accepts and asks how long the king's punishment should last, and Blade tells her to keep it until nighttime. The students start leaving the area, except the two guys who faced Jessica and Claire. They're literally depressed. Meanwhile, inside the virtual world, the king cannot believe his eyes as he sees tons of demons looking at him. During mealtime, Jessica and Claire ask the boys why they're depressed. Ernest asks about the situation and Blade explains they were defeated by the girls. Ernest asks him why the girls won. Blade explains that Claire got better and Jessica went all out. The boys lost because they thought they were stronger and neglected their training. By night, Blade tries to comfort them because they simply lost once. They explain that he doesn't understand them because he never lost to a girl before. In fact, he never lost to anyone. They reveal that they cannot stand the situation because they didn't want to lose to those girls because they like them. Blade doesn't understand the true meaning of those words and says he also likes them. The boys are shocked, thinking he likes Sophie or Ernest, but they later understand what he means when Blade says that he likes everyone. They try to explain what love is to Blade. One of them is into Claire, while the other is into Jessica. One of them explains he likes Claire because she looks innocent, but she can also be ruthless sometimes. The other one likes how Jessica looks free, and he still likes her, despite literally saying that she belongs to the streets. Who gets inside trough the window because you know, she heard everything, and she has the solution. They just need to become stronger, so the girls look up to them. She explains that females are attracted to strong males, so they just need to train. The guys think, makes sense, but don't know how they can get stronger. That's when Ku reveals they just need Blade to train them. Meanwhile, the girls are enjoying the night, giving Ernest even more cakes to eat. This girl has no salvation, but their conversation switches to the other boys not talking to them. Jessica doesn't understand why they're behaving like this, and Claire suggests they lose to them next time. But Sophie and Ernst think that won't work. Guess who's back, back again. It's Ku through the window. She tells the girls that males like strong women, and if the girls get stronger the boys will be all over them. Jessica and Claire reveal they have no interest in the boys. Mission failed. Claire then suggests to Jessica they should miss training, so the boys get stronger than them. But Ernest won't allow it. For the next couple of days, the boys train under Blade's supervision. Can someone explain what the hell is this? After completing the training, there's another virtual reality competition. The boys promise that if they win against them, they will confess their feelings. They are at once matched against the girls, while Ernest and Blade are the referees. Jessica rushes in immediately and Claire follows up. The guys manage to stop their attacks and get the advantage on their counter. Ernest is curious and asks if Blade taught them how to use their fighting spirit. But he explains that he made them realize that they were already using it subconsciously. So, he just taught them how to use elements. One of the guys uses wind against Jessica, and the other one tries to attack. But Jessica uses fire to counter and projects him against Claire, who smacks him on the face. Jessica then focuses on the other one and uses ice to freeze him in place, followed by a lightning attack. This time the boys accept their defeat and promise they will get stronger than them. Turns out all the girls taught Jessica and Claire how to use elements, just because they were being trained by Blade. Ernest is all made because she's expecting Blade to love her, but she has no hopes of him confessing to her. Of course, Blade doesn't understand what the hell is going on. Claire and her friends spot an android, capturing everyone's attention. Intrigued, Claire can't help but find it adorable. Ernest, curious about what has caught their interest, takes a closer look. Sophie chimes in, revealing that the android has been around for about a week. When Ernest wonders if it's waiting for someone, the android displays a picture of Blade. Meanwhile, Blade is engrossed in meditation when Ku interrupts him. He explains that he's sharpening his fighting spirit because he can only access a fraction, 15% of his full power. This meditation, he believes, will help him stockpile some of that strength. Just then, Ernest and the crew show up, android in tow. 
Without a moment's hesitation, Blade annihilates it using his signature Dragon Eater attack. Confused, Ernest questions Blade's abrupt action, mentioning that the androids seem to be seeking him out. Blade clarifies that this android serves as a guardian and is designed to withstand repeated destruction. He ponders aloud whether it ventured above ground specifically to find him. As if on cue, the android scans Ernest. The next day, a transformed android reappears at the arena. This time, it takes on the form of a girl, stating that its new look is designed to appeal to male sensibilities. That's when Claire puts two and two together, realizing this must be the same android they encountered earlier. Blade's reflexes kick in when the android lunges at him. He swiftly defeats it using a barrage of his Dragon Eater attacks. Ernest criticizes Blade for going overboard, but he reassures her, saying the android will bounce back soon enough. Just as he predicts, the android rapidly recovers. Ernest intervenes before Blade can finish it off again. She suggests that maybe the android, now in the form of a girl, just wants to be friends. Blade dismisses the idea, cautioning that guardians are always trouble, especially if they go rogue. The android clarifies her mission. She's been ordered to eliminate Blade and is currently in data gathering mode. Claire invites the android to join their classes. The android warns Claire not to obstruct her mission, or she too will face eradication. Claire notices the word Iona on the android's clothing and decides to use it as a name. The android corrects her, saying it's not a name but an identification number. Undeterred, Claire insists on calling her Iona and suggests that they can collaborate on a strategy to defeat Blade. Ayana agrees. The scene shifts to a group huddle, everyone brainstorming ways to bring down Blade. Curiosity peaked, the group inquires why Ayana is so set on defeating him. Ayana reveals that Blade has repeatedly invaded her and damaged her chassis. Blade defends his actions, saying he had only entered the territory Ayana was guarding, and even had a master key for access. Ayana counters that his biometrics didn't align, rendering his key irrelevant. When Ernest probes for more context, Blade explains that he was visiting the nearby Royal Library of Banned Books to find out about Asmodeus. Ayana chimes in, stating that Blade trespassed 13 more times, leading to Ayana being destroyed 28 times in total and severely reprimanded by her supervisor, Mother. Blade retorts that Ayana initiated the attacks, giving him no alternative. The girls collectively label Blade as ruthless, causing him to sulk and exit the scene, Sophie trailing behind him. Alone, Blade confesses to Sophie that his intrusions were duty-bound, part of his role as a great hero. He justifies his harshness toward Ayana by saying that guardians like her don't die, they store their souls elsewhere. Sophie questions what he'd do if destroying them actually meant killing them. Blade ponders this, admitting he'd have to rethink his actions. Meanwhile, Eliza theorizes that Blade is relentless with Ayana precisely because she's indestructible. Ernest agrees to some extent, citing Blade's icy demeanor. He even once threatened to cut her down. Ayana suggests shifting the conversation to more constructive territory. Seizing the moment, Eliza unveils a plan she's coined as the standalone complex. The idea is to install Ayana's soul directly into her core, making her vulnerable to actual death. Eliza speculates that this would give Blade pause, preventing him from mercilessly destroying Ayana again. We then see Blade and Ayana both poised for combat in a coliseum. Before the first strike, Ayana informs Blade that she's operating in standalone mode, with her connection to Mother severed. Now, if destroyed, she can't be repaired. Blade is puzzled, as he believes Guardians kept their souls elsewhere. Ayana clarifies that her soul is currently housed in her very core. Severe damage would mean her permanent end. The battle commences with Ayana launching an unrelenting onslaught of attacks. Blade tries to counter but hesitates, fully aware of Ayana's newfound vulnerability. He's caught between his instincts as a fighter and his moral compass, reluctant to unleash his full might. Ayana exploits this hesitation, continuing her aggressive offensive. She successfully takes Blade down, remarking that his nature prevents him from harming what he perceives to be an innocent girl. Ayana implies that it's Blade's overwhelming power that led to his downfall. He simply couldn't bring himself to strike her with lesser force. Blade retorts that she didn't leave him room to even attempt less potent moves. Blade concedes defeat, sending shockwaves through the student body. No one can believe that Ayana managed to topple the indomitable Blade. Later, the scene transitions to the cafeteria, where Ayana hesitates to eat. Blade, noticing her reluctance, inquires if she's capable of consuming food. Ayana confirms that she can indeed break it down and convert it to energy. Eliza, observing Ayana's changed demeanor, wonders if her drive has waned after her victory over Blade. Ayana opens up, admitting she's facing an issue she can't resolve alone. In the past, she would have sought advice from Mother, her supervisor. 
The term mother piques Ku's curiosity. Eliza surmises that Ayana must be referring to the mother computer that oversees her operations. Ayana elaborates on this, saying that mother typically assigns her new missions once she completes a task. However, despite re-establishing her connection, mother has now shut her out. Deemed effective for abandoning her duties and severing the link on her own, Ayana finds herself in an unsettling situation. She's grappling with newfound insecurities in the absence of her guiding authority. She turns to Blade, asking if she could call him master, but he flatly denies her request. Ayana drops another bombshell. If Blade doesn't agree to be her master, her self-destruction counter will continue ticking. She explains this built-in timer is a safeguard to prevent her from going rogue without supervision. The revelation shocks everyone. After a quick calculation, Eliza determines they have roughly 84 hours before Ayana's self-destruct mechanism kicks in. Faced with this ticking clock, Blade relents, agreeing to assume the role of Ayana's master if it stops her from self-destructing. Later, the scene transitions to Ayana serving Blade food. She's dressed oddly, prompting Blade to question her attire. Ayana explains that it's an ancient servant's uniform. Now that Blade is her master, Ayana awaits his next directive. Blade acknowledges the convenience of having Ayana serve him but also laments the loss of his personal freedom. Just then, Sophie walks in and accuses Ayana of copying her. From her expressionless demeanor to her obedient stance, awaiting commands, Sophie is irritated that Blade gives commands to Ayana but not to her. She proposes a challenge to Ayana to see who is more deserving of Blade's directives. Blade interjects, asking both to avoid causing any commotion. This prompts Sophie and Ayana to wonder if they should interpret his plea as an official command. Next, Blade notices something different about Sophie, she's wearing cat ears. She explains it's part of her quest to establish a distinct character. Just then, Ayana shows up, donning bunny ears. Realizing they've had the same idea, the two decide on a staring contest as the next challenge. Ultimately, the face-off resolves nothing, so the scene shifts to an unarmed showdown between Ayana and Sophie. Despite the clear rule against using powers, both Ayana and Sophie can't resist and are promptly disqualified by Blade. Undeterred, they spend the rest of the day competing in various ways to serve him better. When night falls, they announce their intention to watch Blade as he sleeps. They agree that the person most suited to serve Blade should also be the one who brings him peace. As Blade drifts off to sleep, the girls keep vigil. Sophie offers Ayana the option to rest if she feels tired, but Ayana dismisses the need for sleep. They acknowledge that they still haven't settled on a winner, but Ayana confesses she's starting to care less about the outcome. For a long time, she was lonely, her only visitor being Blade. Sophie relates, revealing she too was isolated, valued only as Blade's replica. Her connection to the world only deepened because of Blade's presence. Ayana realizes Sophie has also become important to her. They both admit they've enjoyed competing against each other. Observing their newfound camaraderie, Blade feels a sense of satisfaction seeing the two get along so well. The following day, everyone notices a newfound friendship between Sophie and Ayana, along with a slight change in Ayana's appearance. At Blade's command, Ayana reveals the counter on her display. Although it's still ticking down, the rate has decelerated. Eliza calculates they have about 20 hours left. When Blade asks Ayana what she wants to do with her remaining time, she opts to spend it with the group. To fulfill her wish, they throw her a festive party. Sophie nudges Ayana to savor the moment, reminding her that all of this is for her benefit. Ayana revels in the joy of the celebration. However, Ernest can't shake off the concern over Blade's mysterious absence. She searches for him, but he's nowhere to be found. Eventually, the party winds down, and Ayana enters a barrier to brace for her impending self-destruction. She bids everyone farewell, voicing her reluctance to die and pleading that they remember her. Just as the counter hits zero, and everyone braces for an explosion, Blade emerges from the ground. When Ernest inquires about his whereabouts, Blade explains that he went to negotiate with Mother and had to employ some brute force to persuade. Ayana announces her restored connection to Mother in the halt of her self-destruct program. Much to everyone's relief, overcome with emotion, she hugs Blade and bursts into tears. As her for the dramatic scene, it's evident that Ayana is truly happy. A few days later, the Academy decided to hold a major event. A full-fledged battle royale, where students must show off the result of their training. The problem is, Blade easily won it. I mean, Leonard is still up, but let's be real. Never mind, everyone is cheering for him, mostly because they got smacked by Blade. To be fair, Leonard's skill takes 50 years to charge up, all to give him time to make his declaration to Ernest, who didn't even realize he was still up. She even wonders how he survived until now. Finally, his skill finished charging and he rushes toward Blade. 
who simply teleports behind Leonard, making him fall and lose the event. Everyone walks away, mentioning they didn't expect less from Leonard. The guy is dejected on the floor, thinking he doesn't need the others because he has Ernest. Speaking of the devil, there she goes, happy it's time to eat. The guy shatters in pieces, literally. By nighttime, Leonard realizes how strong Blade is, but he wonders if Ernest will notice him if he defeats Blade and he decides to repair his weapon. The next day, he sits on the bench being the typical useless guy, until Maria shows up, asking if he wants to defeat Blade. He says that she doesn't understand, yet she mentions that she doesn't want to be behind Blade. She wants to stand by his side. She thinks that being defeated by Blade is frustrating, even though she never faced him. But she vows that one day, she will be strong enough to stand by his side. Leonard is like, you must love him. She nervously dismisses and quotes the Demon Lord's words, I shall be the one to kill him. Leonard then asks if she wants to kill Blade. His mood quickly returns back to normal, and he even gets motivated. Maria mentions that she knows that Leonard keeps comparing himself to Blade. So basically, she doesn't want him to stop trying to become Blade's rival. She apologizes for her selfish idea, but Leonard is now determined to defeat Blade, just because he wants Ernest to notice him. Maria says she will root for him, just for them to be interrupted by Eliza. She simply calls them dumb because they're idealistic people pretending to be friends. I mean, in reality, there's no way they can beat Blade. Yet, she suggests that with her help, they might find a way to defeat him. The Demon Lord now took over Maria and finds the idea interesting. Eliza has a realistic plan to defeat Blade and they decide to call everyone for a meeting. Leonard explains to everyone they must find a way to suppress and transcendent being like Blade. Yet, Ernest is more curious about why the hell Leonard is their chairman. Eliza doesn't even understand why Ernest is there. Yet, just like them, she has a goal. To defeat Blade, at least once. Leonard keeps his wannabe epic speech on how they're comrades in arms and stuff. Yet, Ernest doesn't understand a single cookie about what he's saying. In short, everyone has a motive to defeat Blade. Except for Sophie, I guess, she only wants Blade to be happy. Leonard then asks if anyone has a plan in mind. But they're all shameless, like, attack during his sleep, poison him. Ernest thinks that's cowardly, but Eliza counters by mentioning that Blade is a coward just because he's so strong. Most of them agree. Eliza explains as if Blade was Godzilla, a superior being that they as humans are trying to take on. So it's normal for them to use any method. Ernest only wants to fight him fair and square because he only uses his sword. She asks if they couldn't challenge him with weapons, he's weak with. But Claire doesn't know how's that different from poisoning him or attacking during his sleep. And since Leonard is such a S-word, he decides to follow Ernest and tells them they should face Blade with the methods they see fit. So basically, he decides to make everyone vow they will do anything to defeat Blade. Ernest decides to challenge Blade with Leonard's lance, yet Blade simply destroys it just by moving his wrist. Jessica is next, she decides to sneak on him while he's sleeping. However, Ayana is there to protect her master and turns Jessica into barbecue. Jessica even though Ayana was on their side, but she only acted as an automatic action. Leonard decides to go next, after fixing his lance for the second time. He promises that he will surpass Blade, who simply advises them to give up. Leonard charges his lance up, yet it simply explodes on his hands. Yes, that dumb guy decided to fix it with tape. Maria decides to attack him while he's picking his lunch and jumps on him as the Demon Lord. He simply throws his shoe at her and defeats her. Sophie challenges with martial arts, yet, Blade simply face bombs her into reality. Claire also tries to attack him from behind while he's picking up his lunch, but he simply trips her onto the floor. It's the useless guy's turn, I don't know their names, they aren't relevant. Their strategy is to distract Blade, telling him to look at the clothless lady. But Blade's like, so what? Yes, the lack of interest defeats them. Ku also joins by attacking him while he's eating, but he simply defeats her by feeding spicy food. Maria tries again, dropping several dumbbells while pretending to fall. Yet, Blade simply catches them all. Ernest tries to beat him in rock, paper, scissors. She lost every game, even at high speed. They try almost every type of challenge, yet, they all fail. During the group's next meeting, Ernest gets the idea to draw lots. They will manipulate it, filling it with losing lots so that Blade can taste defeat. But in reality, they've all been crushed that they all forgot why they're doing this. Ernest still remembers it. Yet, Leonard mentions the goal doesn't matter, it's the process that has meaning. She doesn't care, she wants to defeat him. Ayana then suddenly mentions the time Blade admitted defeat against her. They think about what they did during that time and how they can replicate it. They used Ayana's life as a hostage, so they must now find something to make it a hostage to defeat Blade. The next day, everyone's in class when Blade notices Leonard and the other two guys are missing. 
The girls explain they're doing some errands. Suddenly, three masked guys invade the classroom with swords. Ernest calls them terrorists, despite being obvious it's the other three. But Blade doesn't know what a terrorist is. Sophie explains everything to him, but he's still confused. The guys grab the teacher, who's Blade's doctor, and ask her to cooperate. They take her away and tell the students to get out. Blade tries to follow them, yet, Ernest stops him, explaining their hostages. Blade is confused, and the doctor plays along, asking Blade to help her. Of course, the girls get jealous about the way she does it, and they all ask to be the hostage. Blade is confused and indifferent to the whole thing. The doctor decides to walk away because this must be the heat of youth. In the end, Ernest becomes the hostage along with the rest and asks for Blade's help who in turn, asks Ku what the hell is a hostage. Yet, she doesn't know and says it's non-perishable food. He tries to find a logic behind everything, but he fails. So his thought is that they will take Ernest and the girls away to keep them as food. But he still doesn't understand anything. Ernest starts insulting him, explaining they're in danger and the girls also start complaining about it. In the end, they all beg for his help. Blade tries to do one plus one, but he still doesn't understand anything. The girls keep begging for help and the guys tell him to surrender. But Blade simply calls the boys' names and asks what they are doing. They're shocked and when did he find out it was them? Blade already knew it was them from the start. They ask him how and Blade explains he could tell by the way they walk. They throw their masks at Blade while insulting him. Blade then asks what they are planning to do by taking the girls hostage. They're initially confused, but they keep the act. One of them says they will use them as non-perishable food. Blade says they should eat their friends. The girls are confused because they think the whole scheme is working. The main problem is when the guy goes over. In the end, he gets a massive beating from the girls. They ask if Blade will give up, but our boy is confused and asks why. Leonard explains they know he's weak against hostages because of the way he admitted defeat against Iona. Blade reveals that work that time, but it won't this time. Leonard tries to level up the act by putting his blade on Ernest's neck. They now ask if Blade will give up and what will he do. He simply gets his sword and uses one of his skills. Not only does Leonard's sword shatter, but it also destroys the boy's clothes. Ernest gets supper annoyed and decides to use her fire to turn into a Smodius to attack Blade. Everyone joins the attack, but they end up on the floor in the next second. Blade asks what all of this and Maria replies it's pretending to be terrorists. Blade laughs and tells them this was his first time playing a make-believe game and asks about his performance because he doesn't know the rules. Everyone compliments him and asks if the terrorists will appear tomorrow again. But turns out they're continuing their meetings, mostly because Ernest wants to defeat Blade. Watch this next video. See you on the next one.